so good morning, folks. How are we doing? Uh, we are going to continue with our plowing through the language of the bill. And my bill is open to page 19, although I've been flipping back and forth. So let's call Michelle. And I bet she can remember where we left off. <laughs> Good morning. Good morning. So, um, right, so for the record, Michelle Childs, Office of Legislative Counsel, and we were having a, a scintillating conversation about um, <laughs> mm -hmm. local permits slash licenses um, yesterday. I oh, and I locked that all out. That's <laughs> <fine>. <laughs> um, so actually, I wanted to, I'll just set the, just kind of remind everybody where we're at, is that, um, so the, the league had put forth some asks of the committee, um, and we were starting to kind of walk through those, and Tucker was uh, going point by point with those, and uh, after the committee broke, Tucker and I spoke and trying to think about how we can help you um, contextually kind of discuss and move through those issues, and so what I did is I just did a quick um, uh, amendment with some of the things that were kind of straightforward and simple, maybe the league had just asked for a clarification, like I'm talking about a license and using the same term, and a couple other things. And so you have that um, here uh, up on the screen. And then also, um, Tucker and I were talking about maybe just he came up with a list of bulleted points for discussion points around what the league brought up, and it, because they had asked for an expansion of authority. And so we just kind of boiled that down. So I'm actually going to turn it over to Tucker, and he can talk to you about this. If that's okay. Thank you. Good morning, Tucker Anderson, Office of Legislative Counsel. Um, I'll jump right into the bullet points. What I did was organize the items that were discussed yesterday so that we can move sequentially through those suggestions as they are arranged in the underlying bill and put them into question form so that you can have the straw poll that you intended to have yesterday afternoon. So the first decision point that Michelle already touched upon and it was discussed yesterday afternoon for quite some time. Should subsection B in section 862 be amended throughout to use a single term for municipal licenses? Committee, do you all remember what that refers to? All right. Wow. Which one of the two did we settle? Well, hopefully, hopefully we settled on municipal licenses since that's the way he posed the question. <laughs> yes. Okay. Were the instruments heretofore um, referred to as municipal licenses? I thought there was conversation. So, I, so I already wrote some language for you because I thought that you guys had already decided on that one. So I already well, this one has license. the you don't have to control control license. license. You Thank you. But oh. perfect. All right. So committee, does that seem like a, a good change? Yes. All right. Yes. Check. Okay. The second decision point, and I'll just make sure that I'm reminding myself of these as we go through. We can put them both on there if you want. I did bring up yesterday that members of the committee always insist on having a side-by-side -side that I still do not know how to do on the iPad. I apologize. Sounds like a teaching moment, Jim. Okay. How many lessons? <laughs> do what? I'm not, I'm not going to attend. Just All I know is it says the moment it's not the on the Oh, God. <laughs> 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 Which one is it? I need a picture of this. This is the young guy. Okay. There we go. Oh, oh. oh my God. Oh, I I make it a little bigger so we can actually read them. All right. Okay. <laughs> you know, this I tried is... to teach my son how to whistle. Still can't to this day, and he's 39 years old. Do you, you always feed him crackers first. <laughs> uh, the second decision point here uh, 
this was arranged in two parts of Wynn's suggestions, was whether that same section should be amended to the act of voice and reflect language from section 167A. Uh, it is here highlighted in Michelle's amendment. That seems clear to me, committee. Mm -hmm. okay. All right. Okay. Remember to cry out if you're feeling distressed about any of these, because if I don't hear you, we will move right along. Point number three. The third point is uh, a bit less straightforward and is not in Michelle's amendment up on the board. And that is whether that subsection B should be amended to broaden the conditions on the issuance of municipal permits. And there were two instances where Gwynn suggested broader references. It would incorporate more bases for the conditions. So the first was the suggestion that the specific references to municipal ordinances be eliminated and that conditions be tied to the entirety of 24 VSA section 2291, which contains the list of enumerated municipal police powers. This would be broadening the bases for those conditions. That is the first sub decision point here. Mm -hmm. I'm going to venture, since nobody else is making any motion about this, I'm going to say that I'm not particularly comfortable with that. Um, want to review that, Jim? Yeah, can we? I'm just, I'm not clear what we're asking the local the town to do here at the time that the municipality is issuing the permit the way that s54 is currently drafted yeah they may condition the issuance of that license on two bases one being ordinances that are tied to nuisance public nuisances right. or signs okay so the lead suggestion is to eliminate the reference to public nuisances and signs and tie those conditions to the entirety of 2291. 2291 has 32 subdivisions containing the express police powers that municipalities have. I got it. <laughs> I'm fine with it. <laughs> I mean, I mean, I get the political differences. So. Warren? Mine is very simple. The highlighted thing on the right-hand side of the screen, which document is that, and where do I find that? Uh, this is, I don't know the title, it's under Michelle's name for today, yeah. and it's the S-54 local regulation. Okay, because I'm, I'm looking at the bill that's passed by the Senate, 862 yeah. is only this long and it doesn't have any A, B, or C, or whatever. Okay. okay, so the decision point is whether to make these local control licenses uh, contingent upon the entire 2291. Discussion? I, I think we should leave the language the way it is and limit it to signs and nuisances. I mean, this this is a long list of police powers in, in 291. Yeah. I mean, has everything Regulate from the keeping, keeping of dogs, dogs to, mm -hmm. to things about... Prohibition of circuses, carnivals, menageries. Yes, I, I think we're just opening up Pandora's box. Yeah. yeah. Uh, yep. itinerant vendors, peddlers, door salesmen, yeah. Jim? On the liquor licenses, do we tie uh, localities' hands as to what we do? And yes, what is it? public nuisances, and it references entertainment. Entertainment is 
not one of the enumerated powers in 2291. So really, it is one basis, public nuisances. OK. So I will withdraw my support. I mean, it seems to me it should be for, from making the change. Um, I, it seems to me it should be consistent with what liquor, mm -hmm. what a town can do for liquor. And I get the signage part, um, but in, entertainment and liquor is really talking about bars um, and what they do. And I, unless I'm missing something, I don't. We're not contemplating these bars. Uh, other discussion? Ready for a straw poll? Bob, you look perplexed. We're not talking about bars, we're talking about Rovers Fest and things like that that mm -hmm. would nope. wait. Nope. Nope. We're okay. talking about the five types of licenses. Right. And well, the equivalent of it, I guess. Uh, so, my sense, unless I hear anyone else pipe in, is that we will say no thank you to this suggestion move on to the other yep. subsection of this question. The next is that the reference to specific permissive zoning bylaws be replaced with a reference to the entirety of the municipal and regional planning and development chapter. And uh, what I highlighted yesterday is that there is a specific section in uh, subchapter seven of that chapter that allows municipalities to adopt any bylaw so long as it is not prohibited by section 4412, 4413, or meddling with the appeals procedures. So it is very broad. Questions, committee? Discussion? I think we should leave the language as it is in the as before. Again, because I think you're opening up indoors box. Yep. Agreed. Everybody okay with mm -hmm. saying no thank you to that yep. request? All right. Next item. The next item is up on the board in Michelle's language here. Uh, that is, should 24 VSA, section 4412, which contains the express restrictions on certain types of bylaws, uh, be amended to restrict municipal bylaws that would prohibit the operation of a cannabis establishment. So the language you see on the board states, no bylaw shall have the effect of prohibiting the operation of a cannabis establishment. Cannabis establishment has the same meaning as in this chapter. That we're looking at. So this is again um, following the the basic uh, procedures in the bill, which is to say that a municipality needs to have a resident-wide vote in order to prohibit the cannabis establishment. Correct, and it is contained expressly in the underlying bill here. Um, in subdivision C1, and the suggestion from the Vermont League of Cities and Towns was this is fine, but it should also be added to the zoning chapter so that the planning commissions at the municipal level that work within that chapter all the time will know where to find it and reference it. Are you good with this addition? Yep, sure. Mm -hmm. yep. The next suggestion is that 862C2 here be removed and that the language be added to subsection B to reflect 7 VSA 210 subdivision A1. And what I highlighted for the committee the other day is that the suggestion is that those are equal powers and that swapping them out would be clearer but they are in fact not equal powers. Subdivision A1 
in the liquor title dealing with the local local liquor commissions is uh, it grants those local commissions more power. That is, that they are capable of enforcing all levels of liquor regulation through their municipal licensing process. So they are capable of suspending and revoking their municipal license for a violation of any level, municipal, administrative, or state law. And that is not the case in the underlying bill. Discussion committee? Here, I <laughs> it, talk to me. The the difference between the way that these two would be set up mm -hmm. uh, in the underlying bill, the municipal license could be suspended or revoked by that local commission mm -hmm. if the cannabis establishment violated the local conditions mm -hmm. or violated something that is in the rules that the board prescribed. Mm -hmm. Uh, in the liquor title and an important distinction here might be that these liquor establishments are somewhat ubiquitous and the state would have a difficult time enforcing the set of state laws surrounding this. The municipal permit can be suspended or revoked based on a violation of local conditions, rules that are given by the Department of Liquor and Lottery, or state law. So there's a broader scope of enforcement there that the local commission would be able to carry out. The question you asked sounds more like a policy discussion and decision. So I'm not capable of answering it. So I would just throw out that, um, you know, Tucker made reference to liquor establishments being ubiquitous. I think they're also, um, over the course of our history much more familiar to all of us mm -hmm. and to our local government officials in terms of what they are and what they do. Um, the difference in establishing a regulated cannabis market is that I would guess that cannabis grow facilities, warehousing, extraction facilities, etc., are not at all ubiquitous or familiar to our local government officials. And so the question is, do you do you open up all of the rules and regulations and uh, and tell the, the local folks you can enforce based on any one of these? Um, knowing that most of your local, you know, volunteer officials are not gonna understand what the operation of a grow facility looks like, what an extraction facility looks like, what manufacturing. I, I mean, I'm, I'm comfortable staying with the language that is in the original bill because um, I, until, until there's greater familiarity, I think, on the part of average citizens about what the operation of a cannabis facility looks like, I. You know, I, I worry that the enforcement of all of those rules uh, should be maintained by the folks who have expertise in them. Jim? I, I would only offer that I think we, we walk a fine line in forcing certain dictates from the state to the locality as to what they can and can't do in this new field. Um, for example, um, if a grower got licensed to grow a field of cannabis, marijuana, and it had an odor or there were security issues, um, whatever, um, and neighbors were complaining to the select board, 
I'd like to think the select board had some authority to intervene, mm -hmm. um, much like a select board would get uh, complaints about someone that decided to raise pigs um, and have a pig farm. Uh, and I don't think we want to totally sign you know, handcuff the local board. I think we just have to be very, very careful on this. Yeah. No, I don't disagree with you. Um, I just think if my neighbor was annoyed by the pigs that I was raising, he or she wouldn't have the right to shut me down. You know, I mean, that would be more of a neighbor-to-neighbor -neighbor conversation. Um, well, the town could pass a zoning change, I suppose. That specific situation, without picking on the specific situation, even if up, but go ahead, would be a right potentially a public nuisance. Okay. Which municipalities under this bill are given the ability to <clears throat> revoke at the local level that license for a violation? But but isn't it a similar issue if that cannabis? has an odor um, that your neighbors don't like. Um, isn't that a nuisance then? Yes, I, that is what I am saying. Okay. That municipalities under this are given that Authority. police power okay. and the ability to revoke the local license for that reason. Unless the neighbor came to the nuisance. Because if you moved in next to my grow operation after it had been there for three years, you would not be able to force the town to abate it. Okay. Is there a mechanism in the bill that would allow municipalities to come to the board with any issues or complaints that they might have? I am not sure how the bill functions with regard to uh, <laughs> referrals to the board. That might be a question that Michelle could answer about how the state goes about the suspension and revocation process and whether they receive referrals of violations. I'm sorry, Marcia, can you repeat the question? Is there a mechanism in the bill that would allow municipalities to go before the board if they had complaints that were outside what's already in here, signage and public nuisance? There's not anything specifically on there. I think we're going to be looking at the suspension and revocation language. We talked a little bit about that when we first kind of went through there, and so that could be something you know that you'll add specifically. Around that, and the board is going to be developing rules for the relationship between the local commission and 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 the board with regard to the forms and and the rules of how they're going to uh, enforce the local permits. And um, we can look at putting something specifically in there on that. So we can put this on hold and come back to it, or we can dispense with it right now. But we do need to shift gears. <coughs> Yeah. But what, picking up on what Marsha offered, could that be a path forward for something in between that yes. gave the town the opportunity to petition for a hearing? I, I mean, it's just hard to know what all the um, possible scenarios might be. Absolutely. Yeah. So let's put this on hold. Okay. There is a little mud. <laughs> Thank you, Tucker, for doing your side-by-side -side oh. magic. Thank you for teaching me the side-by-side -side magic. I no, 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 was, was growing tired of hearing, but Betsy can do the side-by-side. -side. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Betsy. Okay, so we're going to shift gears now. Um, Jay Johnson, who is uh, general counsel in the governor's office, is, um, is going to come and uh, present to us. Um, Anything you want brought up. Oh, thanks. All right, let's shut that right down then so we don't have 
screen behind her. Good morning. Thank you for being here. Good morning. Thank you so much for inviting me. Um, I know that the committee uh, is, I think, aware of my opinion. Um, the governor's office has taken the view that the current construct of um, the Cannabis Control Board presents an unconstitutional separation of powers issue. Um, but I would also like to say, just sort of to set the table, um, the attorney, as you all probably are aware, attorneys <coughs> can reasonable attorneys can can differ. Um, you know, if you have three lawyers in a room, you're going to have four different opinions. Um, and when you look at the structure of the way that this is sort of set up, you know, the legislature as a separate branch has its counsel, the governor, the governor, and um, as and the executive branch uh, has his. Mm -hmm. um, so we are all going to probably dif disagree from time to time on how we interpret the relative scope of authority of our, of our uh, respective branches. So I just would like to start there that this is not um, intended in any way to say that I am right and others are wrong. It's just to say that this is my opinion and I'm happy to lay out the basis for that opinion. Um, so anyway, um, first of all, I agree and, I, and the chair shared some materials with me regarding Ledge Council's analysis. Um, I do agree that uh, Ledge Council is correct when they say this is a Vermont separation of powers issue and not a U.S. Constitution separation of powers issue. Um, I further agree that there are limits on legislative action um, in the Constitution. I think that that's fairly self-evident. Um, so that's where I start with my analysis, is with the Constitution itself, the Vermont Constitution itself. Um, and the frame of government is to give the supreme legislative power the exercise um, or to the Senate and the House of Representatives the supreme executive legislative power. Um, the supreme executive power is exercised by a governor um, and the departments are to be distinct. So the legislative, executive, and judiciary departments shall be separate and distinct so that neither exercise the powers properly belonging to the others. Um, with respect to the legislative powers, the express legislative powers relate to um, the exercise of powers in all acts of legislation. And they shall have, you have a very broad sort of catch-all provision where you have all other powers necessary for the legislature of a free and sovereign state, but you shall have no power to add to, alter, abolish, or infringe any part of the Constitution. Um, and again, I'm not here to advise you, but I'm just reading from the Constitution to sort of set out my, the, the legal basis for my argument. Um, the Vermont Supreme Court has, recommend, has recognized the lack of specificity in that broader provision um, in a case called Hunter v. State, which is at 2004 VT 108 from 2004, which considered whether the legislature had unconstitutionally delegated its spending power. And it just noted that Chapter 2 gives the legislature powers necessary for the legislature of a free and sovereign state. But it went on to say that that provision provides little specificity on the nature of those powers. Um, and then there's Section 27 of, um, section of, of Chapter 2 of the Constitution, which is very clear that only the legislature has the power to appropriate funds for the support of governmental programs. Um, with respect to the governor's authority, the governor has express authority to appoint officers, but there is a caveat that this is except where provision is or shall be otherwise made by law or this frame of government. And the frame of government, frame of government, the Constitution itself, does set out certain provisions with respect to the governor's appointment power. Um, say, for example, um, the the Supreme Court, the, the, the nomination and appointment of, of judges. And the Constitution specifically provides for a judicial nominating body and who makes, who shall make recommendations to the governor and the governor ultimately makes the appointment. Um, the governor shall also take care that the laws be faithfully executed. Um, I think that this is key to the analysis. Uh, so obviously the General Assembly has some degree of control over administrative agencies through the exercise of legislative power. Assuming a bill is enacted into law through bicameralism and presentment in accordance with the Constitution, the legislature's tools do often include structural design, delegation of authority, procedural controls over agency decision making, and of course, obviously, agency funding. What can an agency do? It's usually tied to what its ability is with respect to, I mean, how much money it has. Um, 
However, reliance on this kind of authority has to be informed by separation of powers principles. This is not an unfettered power. Um, so the structure and vision for the Cannabis Control Board at this time um, appears to be unprecedented for any other executive branch regulatory body. It's a three-member board with one governor's appointee who serves as chair, one committee on committee's appointment, one speaker appointment. So the governor has a minority position on this board. Alternatively, the board is, is there's been thought to have one governor's appointee, one committee on committees, one speaker, one AG, one treasurer. Um, in either case, an executive director is appointed by and made solely accountable to the board. Um, I believe this governance structure violates the doctrine of separation of powers by effectively ensuring the governor can no longer effectively take care that the laws be faithfully executed. Um, so my support for this view is found in the case law. Um, there is a case, and, and again, there's, there's very little on point with respect to the scope of executive power. So what we um, are looking at is case law that most often talks about limits on the authority of the judicial branch and case law that speaks very often to the unlawful delegation by the legislature of its authority. Um, and very often the court decides, um, I think, you know, is making fair decisions and does a careful analysis of these, um, of these claims. And it's very rare that there is a determination that the, that the legislature has unlawfully delegated its authority. Mm -hmm. So anyway, I look at In Re DL, which is at 164 Vermont 223 from 1995. And in this case, the Vermont Supreme Court held that the judiciary's participation in an inquest did not violate separation of powers. And the court essentially analyzed whether judiciary's participation in this executive branch function was incidental to the discharge of the judicial function. And the court found that it was incidental to the discharge of the judicial function, and it did not find an unconstitutional separation of powers issue. But there's some very helpful analysis in order for the court to determine the power of each branch and ensure that no one exercises the power belonging to another. Um, the court articulates the basic roles of each branch as the legislative power is the power that formulates and enacts the laws, the executive power enforces them, and the judicial power interprets and applies them. Uh, the fundamental principle uh, which is referred to by the court, is that our governmental structure is to divide power to create a structure resistant to the forces of tyranny. The court cites James Madison in the Federalist Papers, who states that the accumulation of legislative, executive, and judicial power into one place is the very definition of tyranny. However, our Supreme Court has also recognized the separation of powers doctrine does not require absolute division of authority among the three branches. No one branch is hermetically sealed from the other. So the court applies a four-part test. Um, but basically, and what it said is that the focus is not whether one branch is exercising certain powers that may pertain to another branch, but whether the power exercised so encroaches upon another branch's power as to usurp from that branch its constitutionally defined function. Okay, so it's not the fact that you may be involved in legislative functions. It will be the scope of that involvement and whether that involvement usurps executive authority. So in In Re DL, in this case, in order to determine whether the judiciary's role in an inquest proceeding constituted an unconstitutional usurpation, the court applied a four-part test. And actually, I'm reading, but it's mostly so I don't forget anything. And if you have any questions, feel free to interrupt. Um, whether the actions at issue are judicial functions or are reasonably necessary or incidental to the discharge of judicial function. Whether the court's role in another department's affairs is merely advisory. Whether the judiciary has any discretion in accepting or rejecting its delegated functions and whether the actions impair the independent institutional integrity of the judiciary. That was the four-part test that they applied in that case. So in my analysis, I apply this test um, to this case. And so I start with whether the actions at issue are reasonably necessary or incidental to the discharge of the legislative function. Do you need 
a majority of legislators in charge of an executive function. The actions at issue relate to the charge of the new Cannabis Control Board. The board, which exists in the executive branch, is responsible for exercising clearly executive functions. They make rules, they administer a regulatory program that, that includes issuance of licenses and enforcement of the applicable law and rules, they administer the medical cannabis registry, they administer a program for licensed medical cannabis dispensaries, which is now performed by the Department of Public Safety, and they submit a budget to the governor. None of these functions, from my perspective, are incidental to the role of the legislature, and yet the legislature seeks majority control of the board through its appointments. Um, the second test was whether the legislature's role in the executive branch affairs is merely advisory. And in this case, no. Um, again, the legislature seeks majority control of the board through its appointments. There's nothing advisory about the role of the legislature in this context. The legislature's role in the normal course of its business may be to investigate and oversee the executive branch, which it does, it's its proper role, in order to ensure the executive is faithfully executing the laws, but it has no authority to both enact and then execute the laws. Um, the legislature in this case does not seek to advise the executive, as it does in other contexts with respect to, say, Public Safety Advisory Board, the Judicial Nominating Board, the Green Mountain Care Nominating Committee, the Racial Equity Advisory Panel. It seeks to usurp executive authority through the appointment process. That would be how I interpret the language. The General Assembly is seeking to vest executive authority in the appointees of the legislative branch. Um, the third test is whether the legislature has any discretion in accepting or rejecting the delegated functions. Well, there's nothing discretionary about these appointments um, or about the function that they perform as the cannabis control board. So I would say no. And then fourth is whether the actions, and I mean in this context, I would interpret um, this to be the participation by the legislature in executive agency governance whether the actions impair the independent institutional integrity of the legislative branch. And I would argue that it does. Um, for the legislature to make appointments and then exercise its proper legislative role to oversee and investigate those appointees would soon seem to me to impair the independent institutional integrity of the branch. So you would essentially have appointees who would also be reporting to the legislature, which is not the way that the constitutional framework works. Um, furthermore, the board is charged with delivering a budget to the governor. So essentially, you have legislative appointees preparing a budget, delivering it to the governor, having the governor make a recommendation to the legislature, whether it's the same or not, and then having those same legislative appointees appearing before the legislature to support its budget request. Um, I would say that you get one crack of the apple, and that's in section 27, which is you hold the power of the purse. You don't get to make budgets and then pass them, except in the context of the legislative session. So obviously, you get the governor's recommended budget, and you do whatever you want with it. But it's subject to a bicameral and presentment process. That's the way the constitutional framework works. Um, on balance, after applying this four-part test, I would conclude the legislature proposes to unconstitutionally usurp the governor's executive authority. Um, finally, uh, I would like to more generally address the limitations imposed by principles of executive authority. So when you have a constitution that gives a governor ex supreme executive power and then gives the governor the personal responsibility to ensure faithful execution of the laws, the governor has been given administrative control of the executive branch. This support for this is found in US Supreme Court case law. Um, and there is a landmark case of Myers v. United States, which reaffirmed the principle, um, <coughs> excuse me, that Article II of the US Constitution, which again is slightly different, Article II of the US Constitution includes the appointment power of the president, which is different than the language in the, in the Vermont Constitution. But Article II of the US Constitution also provides that the president has supreme executive power and shall faithfully execute the laws. So I would argue that we do, the governor does have those general framework, that general framework for, for exercising his authority. Anyway, that court 
reaffirm the principle that Article 2 confirms on the President, confers on the President the general administrative control of those executing his laws. The Court stated, it is his responsibility to take care that the laws be faithfully executed. I believe there's a strong argument to be made that for the purpose of a separation of powers analysis, the appropriate function, the appropriate focus is not just whether the legislature has literally usurped um, the executive function by maintaining legislative control over an executive branch agency, although the current structure suggests that it has, but whether the structure of this board and its appointed executive director are such that they impede the governor's ability to perform his constitutional duty. And by any measure, this unprecedented board structure insulates the agency from accountability to the governor and so encroaches on the authority of the governor to faithfully execute the laws as to usurp the governor's constitutionally defined function. The governor has, again, the governor has minority representation on the board and may not even remove that appointee. The governor has neither appointment nor removal authority over the executive director. There is no accountability to the executive. I would think this is true as well if the legislature were to structure the board in such a way as to diffuse power so that the governor cannot be the judge of the board's conduct. The governor's ability to ensure accountability is an essential aspect of his constitutional duty to oversee the enforcement and execution of the laws. And again, in Free Enterprise Fund, the court, which um, addressed whether the legislature had vested administrative authority in tenured officers who were not subject to the president's direct control, which it found to be unconstitutional, it said, this arrangement contradicts Article II's vesting of the executive power in the president. Without the ability to oversee the board or to attribute the board's failings to those whom he can oversee, the president is no longer the judge of the board's conduct. He can neither ensure that the laws are faithfully executed nor be held responsible for a board member's breach of faith. Such diffusion of power carries with it a diffusion of accountability. Without a clear and effective chain of command, the public cannot determine where the blame for a pernicious measure should fall. The act's restrictions are therefore incompatible with the Constitution's separation of powers. So I, again, would like to conclude by saying that I believe the legislature's authority to structure administrative agencies cannot be used to deprive the governor of his executive power and his constitutional duty to faithfully execute the laws. Thank you. So I don't know where to start. Um, but I'll, let, me, let me try a couple. Um, okay. First of all, um, last year we passed, as you will remember, the Racial Equality Advisory Board, but uh, an issue came up to the board, the way the bill was drafted, the, the, the executive director could not be relieved unless the board approved it. Mm -hmm. um, your governor's office took issue with that and the bill was vetoed. Yes. Um, which might lend one to think that this particular makeup might be also an issue that might invite a veto. Are you prepared to say that this morning? I am not prepared to speak for the governor on the cannabis bill generally at this point. I but think with this particular issue? On this particular issue, we have expressed our concerns to both the um, Senate Judiciary Committee, the Senate GovOps Committee, and now the House GovOps Committee. I can't speak to, as to whether the governor will veto the bill on this issue alone, but you are correct that in the past we have vetoed bills over separation of powers issues. I mean, you know, the governor takes an oath and has an obligation to uphold laws and the Constitution of Vermont, and um, to sign a bill, in my view, with this sort of structure would not be consistent with that oath. Okay, so let me ask you this. We've talked in this committee about expanding the board from three to five members. If those two additional members were gubernatorial appointees giving you a, the administration a majority, um, would that take away that concern? Um, again, I think I would say it's unprecedented for a regulatory board. Um, the board is, I mean, Gov again, 
the, the question would, to my mind would be whether that those appointments, if they were two legislative appointees, whether that appointment is incidental to the authority of the legislature. Again, of course, I think that makes that better. Um, the governor's appointees have a clear majority on the board, and the governor's appointees are accountable to the governor. Um, but, but my question would be why you would need legislators on a, governing an executive branch agency in the first place when your proper role, seems to me, would be oversight and investigation of the executive branch itself. Um, seems to me that that institutional integrity is something that the legislature would want to preserve. Okay, so I heard better. <laughs> okay. You know, you have to put things yes, in, yes, yes. in I got that, I got that. simple, <laughs> not perfect, yes, better. Got okay. it, got it. We, we shouldn't let, you know, Good be the enemy of perfect, so or what yeah. vice versa, or something like that. Um, and just finally, um, the Senate bill was pretty prescriptive in terms of who should be on that board, in terms of background and experience. And I didn't know if the administration had any views on the makeup. Forget about who appoints it, yeah, yeah. but the makeup. Um, to my mind, we may have concerns with the way that it's structured and the particular requirements. I mean, we would certainly want to be sure that whatever, whoever is on the board could actually perform the functions. Um, so, you know, obviously when you're looking at something like the Department of Liquor and Lottery, I think the legislature has generally been very concerned about whether those people have the capacity to operate some kind of a function like that. I mean, it's a business enterprise, essentially, I mean, in, in being conducted in a governmental capacity for the benefit of the public. Um, so my concern would be more operational, but I certainly would not be able to articulate a constitutional objection to that kind of structure. I would believe, I believe that the kinds of qualifications that the legislature decides to impose on govern gubernatorial appointees is part of, you know, falls within the purview of the legislature through the bicameral and presentment process. Um, so yeah, I don't have an, I don't have a legal objection. Thank you. <coughs> Mike. Thank you. Hi. Um, appreciate you coming in and sharing your testimony. Thank you. I just want to uh, ask that as a, as a visual learner, is this going to be available for us to post on? Sure, the I'll, I can I can distribute it um, electronically to Ledge Council, <laughs> and and provide you with that. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I can, and if you would like copies of the cases, I'm I'm happy to provide those as well. Your remarks would probably be sufficient. Okay, thank you. you can cite the case. Mm -hmm. Ah, so do I now, Madam Representative. Um, Jim's question now boils down to not whether it's a majority or minority, it's that legislative participation exists at all. Is that correct? At all? Is that what you said? Well, in terms of <clears throat> appointing and having responsibility for that appointment unfettered on the commission itself. I, it, it, given the language of our Constitution, it's very difficult to say in black and white terms what the appointment authority of the legislature is. Um, obviously, it's not direct, it's derivative um, by reference to the <coughs> governor's appointment power. Um, but it, so, so and that there's, no, there's no real case law. Um, so the question of whether the legislature could put legislative appointees on an executive branch board is one that hasn't been answered. Um, again, the argument, I think the constitutional argument is harder to make when you have a majority. I mean, essentially, when you when you have a clear path to 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 accountability, um, I think my question would be, and a question that will come up in the context of this four point test was the institutional integrity of the legislature, and how do you oversee an entity that's made up of legislative appointees? You know, when does the legislature? You know, I know the Clean Water Board has. Is, is something that, that many struggle with because there are legislative appointees who are both recommending a budget and acting on a budget. Um, you know, there's, there's something problematic about that in the constitutional framework. Well, I don't think anybody envisions actual legislators to be on the right. board. But, but I don't I see substantively a difference. Like, say, a labor board where different constituencies make for recommendations. recommendations and they go yeah. through a process. Is that one of the 
That's, so that's, that's, again, that's a great example of the kind of thing we have now. You have a, a, a legislatively defined process for selecting members to that board, mm -hmm. but all of those members are appointed by the governor. But some have fairly narrow constraints as yes. to who he can. Yes, and the, and, the, and the executive branch agency, like say, say example for you know, the labor members, have to go through a vetting process where labor organizations are asked for recommendations. Those come in, those recommendations are vetted by a panel um, which has a labor member on it, and then those, but again, those recommendations are made to the governor, and there's a minimum of three, I believe, have to be sent to the governor, so that the governor is in effect making the appointment, the commission, the board, the body is not making the appointment for the governor. And we have a long history of incidental commissions that do this exact kind of participation. Legislation puts a couple of people in, government puts a couple of people in, treasurer may put a couple of people in. Yes. Um, but they're not regulatory. Um, yeah, I see those as distinguishable, easily distinguishable, because they're not regulatory. They're not performing a regulatory function. They're performing an advisory function. Okay. They're not executing executive power. And again, Cannabis Control Board rulemaking, strictly executive. Licensing, enforcement, strictly executive. And um, eh, what's the good thing they do? I mean, you're providing budgets. You're overseeing the Cannabis Control Board. I mean, you're doing, um, you know, the medical cannabis entity. So last, near and dear to our heart, last uh, request for differentiation is FEMA, mm -hmm. which clearly the governor has no involvement in the majority of the people who sit there. Right. And they do budgets, they do effectively regulation as to what shall happen with monies and procedures. Distinction. Um, again, I would say that it's not a regulatory enforcement body. It's uh, it, it, the VPIC has a very narrow charge, and that's to make investments in the best interests of the pension beneficiaries with, within certain fiduciary constraints. So I, I would say that that is you know appropriately within the purview of, of the treasurer. The governor does have two appointees. Um, clearly, doesn't make up a majority of the board, but. Um, I would not, I mean, I guess I would find it hard to argue that the governor, because this is a quasi-professional obligation in terms of what the VPIC does, making very sophisticated financial investment decisions for the pension funds, I would say that that is something that you don't want to be politicized, um, that you need to have qualified individuals serving on that board, um, and that you have this, I mean, not that, obviously not that I'm suggesting governor's appointments are all unqualified, but what I'm saying there is it's a clearly professionalized function. And you know what I mean by that. It's just um, you need, uh, even the legislature has provided that they should be investment professionals or have the knowledge and understanding of the industry and the issues in order to be able to you know, perform that function. I would say it's distinguishable because it's not regu it is not per se regulating, it doesn't issue licenses, it doesn't provide enforcement functions. It, it, the only rule it has is with respect to its own conflict of interest provisions. I would say the most apt comparison would be the Department of Liquor and Lottery itself, where last year the legislature rewrote Title VII to enact um, to make a substantive changes to the Department of Liquor and Lottery to merge the, the Liquor and Lottery divisions and in that case created a body of five governor's appointees um, with a commissioner. I mean, it's, it's a more appropriate um, governance structure for an entity of this type. Jim? I should know the answer to this, but do each of these board appointees, regardless of who appoints them, need to be confirmed by the Senate? You can decide that. I mean, you can always decide advice and consent. I mean, it's typically statutory. Not as, okay. as currently it's, but written. Not as is currently written. Okay. Oh, not as currently written, no. But, but typically, that's a statutory provision, except you know, to the extent otherwise required in the frame of government. I mean, that is something that the legislature often has in statute. So certain 
um, you know, so commissioners, I think, typically are, are subject to the advice and consent of the Senate, commissioners and Senates and secretaries, but not <coughs> deputy commissioners. Um, so, you know, the legislature makes those kinds of um, decisions. Are there any, I mean, the, part of this board, because of the regulatory authority, I mean, they can suspend licenses. Um, so there's a sort of a judicial function to what they do. Some quasi-judicial role, uh, yes. Yes, I mean, Green Mountain Health Care Board, uh, Liquor Board certainly, mm -hmm. has, um, you know, with their license, uh, you know, or, or, or other penalties that they can assess. Are there any judicial appointments today that aren't appointed by the governor? Not that I know of. The PUC is appointed by the governor. All of the judicial appointments are, are made by the governor. That's pursuant to the Constitution. Um, I'm thinking Labor Board, governor's appointments. Um, it's hard for me to think of, of anything. Thank you. Any other questions, committee? All right. Great. Thank you very much. I appreciate you being with us this mm -hmm. morning. Please stick around <coughs> for the next rounds of the conversation. So sure. um, next we have David Shear from the Attorney around. General's Office. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and we would welcome <coughs> you to come and share your thoughts on the board appointments. Thank you very much. For the record, David Chair, Assistant Attorney General with the Attorney General's Office. Uh, first, I appreciate the Governor's Council's words at the beginning of her remarks. Obviously, uh, legal opinions are uh, many and diverse. Um, and ultimately, what we try to do when we're making legal analysis is understand what uh, the court of jurisdiction is likely to decide if they're faced with this question. And that's what we try to do in this analysis. Um, it is the opinion of our office that the structure of the Cannabis Control Board does not present a separation of powers issue. And it's our opinion that the Vermont Supreme Court is not likely to find there to be a separation of powers issue. So the question presented by this statute is, uh, is the legislature encroaching on the executive branch's authority? And more specifically, can the legislature appoint an official who performs an executive function? That's the question we need to answer, and that's the law that we need to try to figure out. Uh, a couple of facts to bear in mind, and then I'm going to go into our analysis of how we arrived at our conclusion, looking through the various relevant laws. Uh, one note is that, um, to one thing to note about the statutory scheme as it's laid out in S-54, the legislature does not have the power to remove the individuals that it appoints. So it does, in, in that sense, it does not have ongoing control over the individual who is on the Cannabis Control Board. Another thing to note is that the reality of our current statutory regime in Vermont is that the governor does not always have complete control over uh, boards that, that perform very important functions, for example, um, the Green Mountain Care Board uh, is one where members can only be removed for a cause, which means that if the governor disagrees with the or doesn't like the performance of an individual on the board or disagrees with their policy priorities, that is not sufficient reason to remove that person. It's a for cause, which means the person has to have done some type of wrongdoing. Um, and so the governor does not currently have the ability to fully control every uh, entity and, and impose the governor's policy priorities on every entity that exercises executive functions in the state. Another example would be the Public Utilities Commission where members are, uh, uh, can only be removed for cause. So that's a couple, I just want to, that's sort of some background some about how things, uh, how this statute proposes to set things up and how things currently work in Vermont to lay the groundwork around what it means to control the actions of uh, pieces of the executive branch and the extent to which that happens right now. So the governor's council is completely correct. There is no Vermont case that answers the question that we need to answer, which is, can a legislature appoint an official who performs an executive function, as I mentioned a moment ago? So what the court is likely to do when it's presented with these problems of not having a relevant case is to look to other jurisdictions that may have relevant case law. 
one jurisdiction that our state Supreme Court might look to is the federal government. Um, however, for a number of reasons, the federal precedent uh, and federal constitution is not instructive in this instance. It, is, it does not control the case. There's a couple reasons for that. One, uh, the U.S. Supreme Court has ruled very clearly that the separation of powers regime in, that is um, relevant to the federal government does not apply to the state. So the federal constitution does not control uh, any state's analysis of its own governmental separation of powers decisions. Uh, and secondly, there are key differences uh, between the uh, federal constitution and the state constitution. Uh, the federal constitution makes it very clear that the president has the power to make uh, executive branch appointments and does not grant the, legis the federal legislature, Congress, the power to make uh, executive branch appointments. Um, our Constitution, by contrast, explicitly does allow for appointments to be made um, by somebody other than these executive where provided by law. Uh, and it's also important to note here that unlike the federal system, our legislature has essentially unfettered police power. It can, unless it's contrary to the Constitution, our legislature has the power to make laws. In Congress, they are a uh, legislature of enumerated powers specified by the Constitution, so they can't make laws about just anything. They are limited uh, by what the Constitution says they may do. Our legislature is only limited by what the Constitution says they may not do, which is a significant difference. Um, so federal law does not help us here. We have to look to other jurisdictions. The other jurisdictions our, our Supreme Court may look to are other states, of course. Um, I want to go back and note that uh, our Supreme Court has um, even though they haven't answered this specific question that we need to answer today, they have had general, uh, in other contexts, they have talked about separation of powers. And the way that they talk about it is actually quite similar to other states, the way other state Supreme Courts have talked about it. So I'll read you a brief quote from the Vermont Supreme Court. Uh, and this is actually from the same case that the governor's counsel cited, and I'll return to that case towards the end of my remarks here. Uh, the focus of a separation of powers inquiry is not whether one branch of government is exercising certain powers that may in some way pertain to another branch, but whether the power exercised so encroaches upon another branch's power as to usurp from that branch its constitutionally defined function. So the Vermont Supreme Court, and as we'll see, other state Supreme Courts facing similar language and similar differences in their, between their constitutions and the federal constitution, frequently rule that it is not a clear dividing line between the branches of government. Uh, and just as a practical matter, we understand in the modern era we have an administrative state where we have executive branch agencies who are making quasi-judicial rulings. Um, and there's a, there, as, a pract as a matter of practical governance, we have decided and the courts have accepted that there is going to be crossover in terms of what we think of as classically judicial functions, classically legislative functions, and classically executive functions. Um, some other states that have had, that have faced a similar question, again, we're asking, can a legislature appoint an official who performs an executive function? I keep returning to that because when we're trying to figure out legal questions, we are really trying to figure out the most analogous, we're trying to use the most analogous cases in order to understand what our Supreme Court might do. A Connecticut Supreme Court decision uh, from uh, 2000 faced the question of whether uh, in a situation where four of five elections commissioners were appointed by the legislature and one was appointed by the governor. So similar to here, you had a majority of the commission appointed by the legislature and only one of the commissioners appointed by the legislature, I'm uh, sorry, appointed by the governor. Uh, in that instance, the Connecticut Supreme Court said this is not a separation of powers issue. Um, they pointed to the differences between the state and federal constitutions. And they pointed to the reality in the, in the Connecticut Constitution. They couldn't show that the appointment power was the exclusive province of the governor, the plaintiffs in that case 
the people saying that the statute was unconstitutional or trying to make that argument could not make the argument that Connecticut forbid the legislature from making these appointments. Again, Connecticut has a similar scheme to what we have, where there is a distinct difference, where the law does a lot. The Constitution contemplates that there can be uh, something other than um, governor appointments. Uh, and using language similar to our Supreme Court, they found that there is no assumption of power that lies exclusively under the control of another branch and there was no significant interference with the orderly conduct of the essential functions of another branch. Again, that's the Connecticut Supreme Court weighing in on whether the legislature is allowed to appoint, appoint four out of five of uh, uh, elections commissioners, which are, I would note, uh, a commission that has significant authority in terms of core democratic functions, making sure that there are free and fair elections in the state. Another case that's quite instructive for the current, for our case, actually comes from California something called the California Coastal Commission, which is a very important and powerful commission in California that deals with all kinds of development rights uh, along coastal regions. One third of the members of that commission were appointed by the governor, one third are appointed by the Speaker of the House, and one third are appointed by the Senate Rules Committee. Again, we see a similar setup to what we have here in Vermont. Um, and once again, the, Cal the uh, California Supreme Court ruled that um, because there's nothing in the California Constitution that grants exclusive authority to the governor to make appointments. Um, and similarly to Vermont, um, the California legislature has full authority, so sort of full authority, plenary authority is what they call it, full authority to make laws on any subject that it deems appropriate, subject, of course, to the constitutional limits. Um, and there's not an enumerated authority like our federal constitution. Um, they, and this is also important and quite relevant to S-54. They also found that the legislature doesn't control the people that the legislature appoints. And they found that precisely because the legislature did not have the power of removal. They noted explicitly that if the legislature did have the power of removal in that case, it would present a much closer question and there may be a separation of powers issue. Uh, but like in this scheme presented by S-54, there was not the power of removal, and that difference uh, was very important to helping them decide that there was no intrusion into the core executive function because the legislature couldn't control the actions of the people that it appointed. Um, another case that's relevant, and I will, don't worry, I'm not going to go through every single case we found, <laughs> but I just want to. How many did you find? Uh, we have a number of others, but I'll just do two more that were the most relevant and then just mention some other states quickly. Um, in Louisiana, there was a case that uh, decided on a board of ethics. Four of the five of those members of the board were appointed by the legislature. One was appointed by the governor. Um, they talked explicitly about the issues that the governor's council brings up, that the legislative branch cannot interfere with the uh, executive's constitutional duty to see that the laws are faithfully executed. But even, but even taking that into consideration, they decided that it, um, once again, it was important that the legislature did not have the power of removal and therefore did not control the appointees who are on that board. Found it constitutional and no separation of powers violation. Final case that I'll go into, um, coming out of Kansas by way of the Tenth Circuit. I won't go into the details. It's a certified case. But anyway, the Kansas Supreme Court decided that an ethics commission in which five of the appointees were uh, gubernatorial appointees and six were legislative appointees, so again, majority legislative appointees, um, decided that there was no usurpation of power such that one branch was subject to the coercive influence of another. And again, we see language similar to language that our Supreme Court has used uh, in deciding when, when they talk about these separation of powers issues. There's no usurpation of power <coughs> of the executive branch by having this majority uh, legislative appointees. There are other states that have addressed the issue of whether the legislature can appoint uh, executive officer or op people who perform executive functions, I should say. Uh, those states include um, Arkansas, Delaware, Georgia, South Carolina, Tennessee. There may be others. I will acknowledge to the committee that we did not have time to do a full 50-state survey. We did the best we could in a fairly short period of time. Those cases do all find that it's constitutional for the legislature to appoint individuals who 
uh, perform executive functions. I will say that those cases are slightly less analogous. They're not necessarily cases with majority legislative appointees, but they are still instructive uh, for us. It is the case that there are some states that have come out the other way on this. It's not a universal rule. It doesn't appear to be a universal rule that this is that Supreme Courts have found it allowable, but we think, based on our research so far uh, and the reading, the research that um, the other Supreme Courts have done <laughs> into what is happening around the country, it seems clear that it is a, a strong majority rule uh, among states that have decided it so far that um, it is not an unconstitutional intrusion on the separation of powers to allow this type of legislative appointment. Um, for example, in New Jersey, for example, which came out the other way, it's a little different because their constitution explicitly forbids um, the legislature from making such appointments. We don't have a similar um, case, or sorry, a similar provision. Taking a step back from all of this, what are some of the key takeaways from all of these cases? Some key takeaways are that uh, virtually all of these cases distinguish the state constitutions and case law from federal and acknowledge that there is more flexibility in the state system. Um, and again, we have the same difference that these other states have in terms of differences between state and federal. It is not dispositive that there is a constitutional provision. It was, in none of those cases, I should say, some of those cases that I mentioned had constitutional provisions similar to ours. Some did not. Their separation of powers relied solely on a case law analysis. But in the ones that did have a uh, constitutional provision for separation of powers, in none of those cases was that dispositive. Uh, again, they said, sure, there's a separation of powers, but what does that mean as a practical reality? And they looked at the facts of the statutory provision and decided that in provisions very similar to the one proposed here, there was no constitutional issue. It also seems clear, as a second big takeaway, that the amount of control exercised over the individuals who are going to be occupying these roles is important, at least in some of the cases, and we believe it will be important here. Um, without the power to remove, uh, that is a key difference. It was a key difference in uh, both California and Louisiana. Um, and, and that meant for those courts that the legislature was not exercising executive functions. They were simply making an appointment for somebody who would then be exercising legislative functions. There's also a, Supreme, a U.S. Supreme Court case uh, in which the power of removal was the key to measuring how much control a branch holds over somebody. And we, even though it, that case wouldn't be binding on us, the legal principle, we think, holds here as well. Um, the Governor's Council did mention in Ray DL, and I wanted to just briefly address that. The question in that case was whether the judiciary's power was unconstitutionally usurped or expanded by the executive branch. So it was a different question that was being asked by the court. We're trying to figure out, is the executive branch's power usurped by the legislature? There's three branches. There's a number of different combinations of uh, usurpations that might happen or unconstitutional intrusions on the separations of power. Uh, and because it was judicial functions that that court was inquiring about, not executive functions, there were different considerations that the court had to go through. And, cons and they were considerations that would only be relevant to the judicial branch. So for example, um, the power of judicial review. That's something that is really just relevant to the judiciary. They get the final say over interpreting the laws. So they were thinking about that. They were also thinking about um, whether, uh, the, whether the statutory scheme would render a judicial opinion merely advisory, which gets into a concept about the judiciary in our state and most, but not all states, are in the federal government are only supposed to issue opinions about real cases and controversy, and that's in order to prevent there from being a um, bleeding over, a mixing of legislative and judicial authority. The judiciary is only supposed to decide cases which are specific cases, specific people with specific disputes, not sort of issue general opinions about what the law might be in some unknown future case. That's a very complicated and in-depth analysis that happens. But the point being, with INRAE DL, they were addressing issues that are specific to judicial concerns, not executive concerns. 
And for that reason, we believe that the Vermont Supreme Court in deciding a separation of powers issue would be unlikely to look to In Re DL because the uh, issues that were of concern would not be of concern in this case. Um, that is the outline of our analysis. Um, I hope I didn't bore you too much. The, uh, <laughs> the, the, but the analysis that we went through, as I said, we're looking for uh, analogous cases. We look to other jurisdictions when there is none here. And we do believe that the majority rule and the likely way that, the Supreme, that our Supreme Court would rule would be to follow that majority rule, especially given that we have cases in other states that are quite analogous to the situation presented by S-54. And for that reason, we think that there isn't a separation of powers issue and that our Supreme Court is unlikely to find one. Thank you. Jim. So um, thank you, David. Um, you mentioned something that I'm not sure I quite followed about removal. And last year, the governor vetoed a bill specifically over the provision that um, the governor could not, the executive branch could not remove this person that worked within the administration. Um, does that change the dynamic if that's the issue? Because right now, this executive director works solely for the board, doesn't work for the governor. Um, so if the governor had issues with the executive director, uh, theoretically they could not remove that person. So does that change the um, potential look, how courts would look at it? When you say executive director, you're referring to the cannabis control mm -hmm. boards. Yes, I'm sorry, director. yes. Mm -hmm. I think, so the racial equity is, uh, issue I think was slightly different than the one we have here. Here we are talking about uh, a board that's exercising a combination of, frankly, uh, some legislative authority, some executive authority. The, as I understand the governor's issue, and I, have, I didn't go back to look at this, so I would want to, before I give you a definitive opinion, I would want to reread the statute as it was passed by the legislature and be done. Um, my understanding was that the governor's argument in that case was that this was a singular executive official who would be in the cabinet uh, and who the governor could not remove. Hire. Right. And I think that that is a different situation than the one presented here. I think the Cannabis Control Board is more analogous to something like the Green Mountain Care Board or the Public Utilities Commission where it is a body that has a number of different governmental functions. Mm -hmm. um, it does some things that are more like a legislative function, some things that are more like an executive function. And um, the legislature decided on those boards and commissions, and they, you may decide in this one, um, that, they, that there are public policy reasons to give it a certain amount of independence, mm -hmm. and therefore the four cause limitation on removal is in place. And so it's not quite the same thing as having an executive, a singular executive officer who's in okay. the cabinet. So it's fair to say it's unclear. I, I think they're not similar situations. Okay. So, um, so let me ask you this. If um, cannabis S54 becomes enacted um, and an issue was brought forth, a challenge was brought forth down the road, would it make a difference if the governor signed the bill or it was enacted with a veto override in terms of how the court might look at it I don't believe that a court has ever and I that's a bit that's a broad statement I don't think but I don't <laughs> think that a Vermont court has ever used a veto override as a, as a reason to find something more likely to be lawful I don't think that would enter into their calculations okay. Uh, I'm the lay person here. That's so understood. Yeah. Um, okay. No, thank you. Bob? No, that touched on my questions. Thank you. Any other questions, committee? All right. Keeping a running tally, we, we have uh, now a third attorney. Um, I'll just ask if that, I didn't see that testimony online either. I can't get 
it is in very raw note form, but I will work on laying it out a little bit and getting you a hard copy of that. Thank you. Uh, so now Betsy Unrask has been doing some work on, um, on this issue as well. And um, now we have the opportunity to ask Howard. <laughs> 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 Do, do you have Boston cream in there? Uh, phew. It smells in here. So thank you, Betsy Ann. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. Do you uh, do right need here. some extra space there? Because I'm, I'm going to spread out a little bit. If, if I take up too much? No, I'm going to squeeze it. Yeah. 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 Hello, thank Representative Devereaux. <laughs> Madam Chair, thanks for giving me this time. I'm just getting settled. Um, I pulled up behind me a memo that's posted on your website. I do have hard copies for the Governor's Council and for the Attorney General's Office as well. Um, it's also posted online for anybody else. For the record, Betsy Ann Ross, Legislative Council. Thank you. I just want to start out first by saying thank you to the Governor's Council and to the Attorney General's Office for being here um, and for discussing this issue. Um, it is an important issue and I appreciate that we're able to get this input um, from multiple parties. Um, I'm just going to recap a lot uh, first of what you've already heard. Um, to recap, you've got S54 as past Senate. It would create a cannabis control board as specifically an independent entity within the executive branch. Under the bill as passed the Senate, it's a three member board um, consisting of one governor appointee, one house appointee, and one Senate appointee. And specifically, a board member could only be removed for cause by the remaining members in accordance with our Administrative Procedure Act. Um, I had stated in the memo, it was stated again today, um, the administration's position is that this board with two legislative appointees and one gubernatorial appointee is a clear usurpation of executive power in violation of the Vermont Constitution. And to state explicitly, the Office of Legislative Counsel does not agree with this opinion. Our opinion from our office is that this board structure does conform to the separation of powers requirement our opinion is based on applicable case law from the Supreme Court of Vermont, which is provided in the initial SCOBY throughout these, this memo. Um, specifically, Vermont Supreme Court case law regarding separation of powers, and also instructive case law from the US Supreme Court and other states. So this memo that I'll review with you um, summarizes the basis for our office's opinion, including those legal authorities. It provides an overview of Vermont separation of powers requirement and of each branch's power. And with that information, analyzes the constitutionality of the proposed Cannabis Control Board. Before I move on, I just want to say that I'm happy that we're having this conversation today about separation of powers. Um, this has been an issue that's been raised in S54, but also recently in other contexts. For example, on Tuesday, I was in a Senate committee which was discussing adding two legislative appointees to a proposed 15-member executive branch board. Um, an official from one of the administration's departments was asked for the administration's opinion on the proposal to add two legislative appointees. And the official stated that the administration did not support the proposal because, quote, due to separation of powers, end quote. Uh, assertions that the legislative branch was unconstitutionally usurping the power of the executive branch in violation of separation of powers were also raised in at least two veto messages in 2018. And I know those assertions also are being made in other committee contexts. So it's good we're having this conversation today in House GovOps because you are the Committee of Jurisdiction on Separation of Powers um, as the Committee on Government Operations. Um, and we've already discussed this issue 
in regard to separation of powers and each branch's power. In your introduction to government operations that we did at the beginning of this session, we went through that whole memo that I put together for you. It's still posted online. It contains lots more information than what I provided in this memo to you today. This is a truncated version, but it's going to highlight the main issues. Um, but to reemphasize, this is an important discussion to have because it does go to the heart of constitutional governance. Um, specifically, these assertions about uh, limitations on the scope of legislative power are challenges to your legislative authority to enact laws that set the policy for the state, which is your constitutional power. The legislative branch is the lawmaking branch by the policy that you set forth in the laws you enact. The structure of this board, as it's currently presented, is a policy decision, not a constitutional decision in our office's position. Um, you're considering the idea of whether to add two more executive branch appointees. I'm going to focus on the issue of majority legislative appointees to executive branch, um, but these are policy decisions for you to make. This is what you do. You talk about policy. I'm not here to talk about policy. I'm here to make sure that you're aware of the scope of your legislative authority so that you know that you have the constitutional authority to make these policy decisions. So what I'm going to do this morning is review separation of powers overall and then specifically, specifically apply to the provisions of S54. So first, as we've done before, what have we said when we're talking about constitutional issues? You've got to take it from the top, starting with the U.S. Constitution. But as we've already heard, and our office agrees, federal law does not apply. Um, the U.S. Supreme Court has held that the U.S. Constitution does not contain requirements regarding how a state is to apportion power among its three branches. And also, that whether and to what extent a state should have a separation of powers among its branches is an issue within the state's control. So this is a question of what our Vermont Constitution requires. So we're going to focus on our Constitution. And as already stated, our Constitution does provide a separation of powers requirement. It's set forth in Chapter 2, Section 5 of our Vermont Constitution. It requires that there be a separation of powers among the three branches so that they shall be separate and distinct, so that neither shall exercise the powers properly belonging to the others. And as already quoted, to summarize how the Vermont Supreme Court has captured our three branches' powers is to say, briefly stated, the legislative power is the one that formulates and enacts the laws. The executive power enforces them. And the judicial power interprets and implies them. So legislative branch legislates through the laws you enact, which contain the policy that you decide. Executive branch executes those laws. And the judicial branch adjudicates challenges to them. But the court has said that overlapping powers are permitted because our Vermont Supreme Court has said that the separation of powers requirement does not contemplate an absolute division of authority among the three branches, such that each branch is hermetically sealed from the others. And the Supreme Court stated that due to the practical realities of government and because there are many functions and powers that can't be easily defined and classified, it will apply a relatively forgiving standard to separation of powers complaints or claims that are tolerant of separation or overlapping institutional arrangements. Our court has stated that it must construe the constitutional command of separation of powers consistent with efficient and effective government structures that are able to respond to the complex challenges and problems faced by today's state government. The court also has provided a test of what constitutes a separation of powers violation. First, the power that's being exercised has to be somehow incidental to the discharge of the functions of the branch exercising them, and that thereafter the focus of a separation of powers inquiry is not whether one branch is exercising certain powers that may in some way pertain to another branch, but whether the power so exercised encroaches upon another 
branch's power so as to usurp from that branch its constitutionally defined function. So I've been talking about a Vermont Supreme Court case law. Why do I keep going back to the Vermont Supreme Court? Because in the checks and balances of our three branches, it's the province of the courts to decide whether Vermont's laws comply with the state constitution. It's the function of our courts to maintain constitutional government. And the Supreme Court of Vermont is the final interpreter of the Vermont Constitution. So I'm providing legal opinions here today. The executive branch is providing legal opinions here today. But only the judicial branch can make binding constitutional adjudications. But what I have done here in this memo is used their case law to support the analysis of the constitutionality of S-54. Our court has said that when it's reviewing laws enacted by the General Assembly, it's not going to strike them down due to disagreeing with the policy. The court has said it's not for the court to pass upon the propriety of legislative election to exercise its regulatory power, nor to question the wisdom of it. Our function is only to determine whether or not the manner or its exercise meets constitutional standards and violates any fundamental rights. The courts have said in another context that people don't get to have the court act as a super legislature to retry policy judgments. You're the policy makers. The court just determines whether your policy is constitutional. And the court has also said that it presumes your statutes are constitutional. When it's analyzing your exercise of your legislative authority, it's presuming you acted constitutionally. There is a presumption of constitutional purpose on the part of the legislature, a presumption as strong, perhaps, as any that is not conclusive. This has been stated repeatedly. For example, I've quoted um, a 2010 case where the court said, we start by emphasizing that statutes are presumed to be constitutional and are presumed to be reasonable. We have often observed that the proponent of a constitutional challenge has a very weighty burden to overcome. And our courts won't hold that your laws are unconstitutional unless they clearly conflict with constitutional requirements. And one of my favorite quotes from our Vermont Supreme Court on this issue, the court stated, the efficient exercise of police power inherent in the people of the state through you is not to be frittered away by over nice speculations upon the distribution of powers of government. Every presumption is to be made in favor of the constitutionality of an act of the legislature, and it will not be declared unconstitutional without clear and irrefragable evidence that infringes the paramount law. Isn't that beautiful language? <laughs> <laughs> I always wondered how you used irrefragable. <laughs> <laughs> So let's talk about you, the legislative branch. You have supreme legislative power that's restricted only by the Constitution. As the General Assembly, the two chambers hold supreme legislative power. It includes the power to prepare bills and enact them into law. And the Supreme Court describes you as the lawmaking branch of government. However, you don't have any power to add to, alter, abolish, or infringe any part of the Vermont Constitution. In other words, the only thing that limits the General Assembly's authority is the Constitution. The Constitution is not a grant of power to the legislature. It's a limit on your powers. Your power is practically absolute except for constitutional limitations. And you exercise that power through your police power, your policymaking power. There's a provision in our Constitution that gives the police power to the people of the state through their legal representatives. And they have the sole, inherent, and exclusive right of governing and regulating the internal police of the same. When the Vermont Supreme Court has construed the police power, it is stated that subject to constitutional limitations, a state legislature is authorized to pass measures for the general welfare of the people, the state, and the exercise of the police power, and is itself the judge of the necessity or expediency of the means adopted. Expediency meaning what works. What is pragmatic? What's useful? In regard to the police power, the Constitution clearly empowered the legislature to pass such laws as, in its discretion, it might judge would be for the common benefit of the people of this state. 
That's a summary. Let's turn to the executive power. Executive power means carrying out the laws. It's the conferred authority to execute the law that you enact. And aside from the, any constitutional authority given to a specific executive branch entity, it's the General Assembly that determines the executive branch entities to which it will confer authority, what laws they must execute, and how they must be executed. So for example, the Vermont Supreme Court stated that our prior Public Service Commission has only such powers as are expressly conferred upon it by the legislature, together with such incidental powers expressly granted or necessarily implied, as are necessary to fulfill the powers granted, and it's merely an administrative board created by the state for carrying into effect the will of the state as expressed by its legislation. The commission, therefore, is to be classed as an agency of the legislature. You set the policy and how you want the law to be through the text of the bills that you enact in the law. Jim, do you have a clarifying question on this? Just, I mean, point out the obvious. We have extreme, uh, whatever you call it, legislative power, but only if something is enacted by two-thirds if the administrative <coughs> branch does not. The executive the branch, district. the governor specifically. The governors are right. supreme executive power. It's a check on your power. Right. Yes. The governor can agree and so, sign. So we have different attorneys with different opinions on whether this is constitutional or not. Mm -hmm. But the political reality is their opinion counts for two thirds of the legislative. <laughs> I can't speak to that. Okay. I'm not speaking. No. Yes. We have limits on our. You have pol You have to consider these policy right. implications. I'm here just to talk about the constitutionality. And you're doing a great job. Policy is your you business. You make this interesting. Good. Even though it's kind of a dull subject. No, this is not a dull <laughs> subject. This is not a dull subject. <laughs> um, I want to emphasize um, something that's already been stated. Um, just mentioned uh, that the Vermont Constitution names the governor the supreme executive power. The governor has great power compared to the other executive branch entities. The governor gets to approve or veto or allow laws go, to go into effect without his or her signature. It's a check. Other entities don't have that. But the Vermont Constitution also created in the executive branch Four other separately elected statewide officers, our lieutenant governor, our treasurer, our secretary of state, and our auditor of accounts, and also pro, uh, created district elected state's attorneys and sheriffs. None of them are under the control of the governor. Those are separate entities. Also, you have created by statute the separately elected statewide office of attorney general. That's a statutory office. And also you've created executive branch entities that are to be independent from any other entity, such as the Green Mountain Care Board has already been mentioned, and the State Ethics Commission. S54 would likewise create a new independent cannabis control board within the executive branch, like the Green Mountain Care Board. Because there are multiple separate independent executive branch officers and entities that are not under the governor's control, the Vermont governor's supreme executive power is distinguishable from the executive power in our federal government, which by U.S. Constitution Article 2, Section 1, Clause 1, vests the executive power in the president. To quote, the executive power shall be vested in a president of the United States of America. That is not true of the Vermont Constitution. Similarly, unlike U.S. Constitution Article 2, Section 2, Clause 2, which provides the President with the power to appoint all major offices of the United States with the advice and consent of the U.S. Senate, the Vermont Constitution provides to the Governor the limited authority to appoint officers except where provision is or shall be otherwise made by law or this frame of government. This means that the governor has the power to appoint officers except provided by the laws that you enact or by the Vermont Constitution. 
you control the governor's appointment authority, unlike the president's appointment authority. So therefore, U.S. Supreme Court case law regarding the scope of presidential power is not on point to the scope of Vermont's gubernatorial power. And I needed to emphasize this point here because of the prior separation of powers claims the governor has made. So for example, we've already talked about that veto message of 2018 S-281, um, the veto of the mitigation of systemic racism bill. Um, the governor's veto message, I've linked to it, provided that the governor was vetoing the bill because it would not permit the governor to remove an official that the bill gave him the authority to appoint. The governor stated that the removal power incidental to the appointment power is essential for a governor to take care that the laws be faithfully executed in accordance with the Constitution. There was no citation for where this quote came from, but I believe it seems to have come from U.S. Supreme Court case law, such as Myers v. U.S., which I've cited here, which held that the president's power of removal, which was, was incidental to his power of appointment and was necessary to take, for the president to take, take care of the laws be faithfully executed. But this cannot be true for the governor of Vermont, who shares executive branch authority with separately elected officers and separate statutorily created independent entities that are not under the governor's control and are specifically created to not be under anybody else's control. Moreover, the Vermont Constitution does not provide the governor with specific removal authority. So accordingly, the Vermont Supreme Court has recognized the General Assembly's ability to control governor removal authority. In a McFeeters v. Parker case from 1943, the Vermont Supreme Court adjudicated a challenge to the governor's authority to remove members of the Public Service Commission, who the governor had appointed with the vice and consent of the Senate. The court stated whether the governor should have this power of removal is for the legislature to decide. We are not concerned with the expediency of the law, again, the usefulness, the pragmatic nature of the law, the policy decision not a constitutional decision, the policy behind it. And statute is in line with this Vermont Supreme Court holding. It's statute that generally provides the governor with discretionary removal authority of the people that the governor appoints. There are two provisions in Title III, 3 BSA, Section 258 and 2004 that say, except as otherwise provided by law, the governor gets to remove at his or her discretion the people that the governor appoints. But that's a statutory authority and it can be limited by statute as well. And I provided as an example, for example, <laughs> for example, um, if you turn to the Public Utility Commission statute, 30 BSA section 3E, it requires the governor to appoint the members of the Public <coughs> Utility Commission, but it says can't be removed in the governor's discretion, there has to be cause for the governor to remove PUC members. I also want to point out the Green Mountain Care Board statute, 18 BSA 9374B4, and their related draft rules. That statute provides that Green Mountain Care Board members are appointed by the governor, but specifically, members of the board may be removed for only for cause. And the board shall adopt rules pursuant to the Administrative Procedure Act to define the basis and process for removal. This statute does not give the governor the authority to remove Green Mountain Care Board members. The Green Mountain Care Board is working on its draft rules. I've provided them here. They're linked in this memo. The Green Mountain Care Board draft rules would provide that a member of the Green Mountain Care Board may be removed for cause by a majority vote of the participating members of the Green Mountain Care Board. So like S54, like the State Ethics Commission, the board members themselves would be the ones that are able to remove themselves. There's a one power of appointment and a separate power of removal. Under the Green Mountain Care Board, which is created as an independent entity, the members themselves have the power of removal over themselves to keep each other in check. They're not accountable to the governor in that way <clears throat> because they're created to be independent and separate. So 
that's a summary of separation of powers and the three branches of powers. Um, so then what this memo does is just apply that analysis to the proposal on S-54. And again, to emphasize, I haven't included all the details of all the powers. You can go back to your introduction to Bedlock's document if you want to read more about it. It's included in this analysis. But first, one thing to consider is that the Vermont Constitution does not state that an executive branch entity cannot be comprised of a majority of legislative appointees. It's just not an issue that's addressed in the Vermont Constitution. Moreover, there's no known Vermont Supreme Court case law that addresses whether such an executive branch entity violates separation of powers. Therefore, because the only thing that limits the General Assembly's authority is a constitutional provision, because the Vermont Supreme Court will apply a relatively forgiving standard to a separation of powers claim that is tolerant of over overlapping institutional arrangements, and because the Vermont Supreme Court is not indicated otherwise, we must presume that S-54's board structure is constitutionally permissible, since there's no clear and irrefragable evidence to the contrary. Um, that's under our Vermont analysis. We can look to other case law that is instructive to help us with this analysis. For example, it's already been mentioned, the US Supreme Court case, Bowser v. Sinar. Um, while federal law does not control our separation of powers requirement, that case is instructive from the U.S. Supreme Court. In that case, the U.S. Supreme Court quoted a lower district court which held that once an officer is appointed, it is only the authority that can remove him and not the authority that appointed him that he must fear and in the performance of his functions obey. And S-54 adheres to this principle. In maintaining the Cannabis Control Board status as an independent entity within the executive branch, a board member may be removed only for cause by the remaining board members in accordance with the Administrative Procedure Act. And just to note, this same principle is applied to those other independent Vermont executive branch entities, including the Green Mountain Care Board and the State Ethics Commission. Also, I think this case law has already been mentioned, instructive case law from other states. There are a few um, that I've just provided here for reference. We've got one from Kansas that was already mentioned by the AG's office where the Tenth Circuit um, certified to the Kansas Supreme Court the question of whether uh, a governmental ethics commission with six legislative appointees and five gubernatorial appointees violated separation of powers. They held that it did not. In a 1990 case out of Louisiana, the Supreme Court of Louisiana upheld a five-member board of ethics for elected officials within the executive branch, which contained four legislative appointees and one gubernatorial one. And then that California case that you've already heard about, where the Supreme Court of California upheld the California Coastal Commission within the executive branch, um, which contained two-thirds legislative appointees and one-third gubernatorial appointees. <clears throat> I know you're running out of time. The last thing um, that I'm going to mention here is I've just provided for reference some examples of other Vermont executive branch entities that currently have mixed appointments. It's not an exhaustive list. Actually, Michelle just mentioned to me, oh, here's another one that we can add. Um, but here's a list. We've got, for example, the 16-member Commission on Women, eight gubernatorial appointments, eight legislative appointments. We've got the five-member <coughs> State Ethics Commission. It's an executive branch entity. It contains no executive branch appointments. One member is appointed by the Chief Justice, and four members are appointed by private entities. It's exercising executive powers. We've got the five-member Racial Equity Advisory Panel. It contains no majority branch appointees. Two are legislative appointees. One's a Chief Justice appointee, one's a gubernatorial appointee, and one's a Human Rights Commission appointee. We've also got the 17-member Vermont Working Lands Enterprise Board, which contains seven gubernatorial appointees and 10 legislative appointees. And then another example is the seven-member Clean Energy Development Board, which contains three members appointed by the Commissioner of Public Service and four legislative appointees. That is our analysis, Madam Chair. Um, happy to work with you further as you navigate this question. Um, 
here for any questions on this issue now or later. Thank you. Questions for Betsy Young? So committee, we have um, about 25 minutes, 20 minutes before we have a scheduled lunch break um, because we need to come back here at 12.30 um, since that was the only time we could snag a little bit of um, Michael O'Grady's time. Uh, so he and Betsy Ann will be back with us at, uh, at 12.30. Uh, but I thought it would be useful for us to spend this time uh, having a committee discussion um, around the question at hand, which is uh, um, around the appointment of board members. And I will open it up to folks who either have questions for the folks who presented to us or who um, have a question to pose within the group. And those of you who have a agenda in front of you will be very patient, I'm sure, and not asking questions first. I can't miss this. I'm sorry. Oh, I see. He's on the edge of his seat. <laughs> Whoops. I got this camera there. Right for the camera. <laughs> Didn't take my advice. So, it's always a good idea to have dessert before lunch. Um, Bob and then Mike. I uh, still lean toward five being a better number than three, but I think. Uh, Deferring to my great respect for everyone that's presented, I think we're uh, moving in the right constitutionally prescribed here. Okay, Mike. It, it seems like we're we're on the edge of repeating history again in terms of having a bill vetoed because of a, an appointment that's deemed constitutional by the governor and there seems to be a good deal of other evidence to the contrary. In, in the long run, I, I just wonder if this actually weakens the governor's office. If they keep insisting on one thing and the courts find another. So I don't know if we're going to have to go to the courts to establish that. But in the end, it seemed to weaken the governor's office, making assertions such as this. It, it, it seems pretty clear, though, from what our council has put forward. Like Betsy here, great job. Thank you. For the, for the record, <laughs> I share my opinion. Betsy did a great job. And as, as our lawyer, uh, I feel we were well served. And there seems to be that. A, Especially clear line that what I heard the, the governor's council using as precedent was U.S. law, and what seems pretty clear is that cold water here. So I'm unclear that we can go ahead or should go ahead in the same way. That we're on pretty solid legal footing as far as the makeup of the board. That's the question. Now. I think five is a good number. Jim? So at the end of the day, the governor's office opinion does matter unless we're going to pass something with two thirds. Um, so I don't think we can ignore it. Um, and I would suggest out there, even though so far the board structure is not what I would have envisioned, um, I would suggest trying to make it better by with the five of given three of the five appointees uh, from the governor's office uh, and that all appointees perhaps may be at advice and consent of the Senate if, if that helped. I mean, maybe that complicates it. I don't know. I just throw that out there as a way to move forward um, or I can be an island of one again and stay at this end of the table, but I'm just, I'm trying to help you get to a path forward, and I may not be on the right path, but I'm trying to help you get there. Nelson? I understand where Jim's coming from, but I think 
one of the things w was that we had the authority to do in drafting this is to specify what those five members would have to have for credentials to be in there. And I think if we went the way Jim's talking, we have to make sure that we do a good job of specifying what those credentials are and what we're looking for each board member to be. Um, I, I thought we had sort of deviated away from that a little bit in that by having the five member board, they would have access to a fairly diverse advisory board that would have the areas of expertise that they may need at any particular time was what I sort of thought we wound up bad more. Yeah. Yes. John. Um, you know, there are many areas that I'd be willing to compromise on within S54. However, when there's an issue of the power of the legislature, um, especially when it seems to be continually challenged as to our appointment authority for boards, that's something I don't want to compromise on because that's actually giving up legislative power that's in the Vermont Constitution. Um, and I feel strongly that this isn't something I can compromise on um, because I, I think, you know, both the Attorney General's office and, and Legislative Council have put forth um, excellent arguments as to what our legislative power is, and I don't think in this instance we are violating it. And I would be concerned about making a compromise um, and giving up or legislative power that we clearly have under the Vermont Constitution. On policy issues, as, as Betsy Ann has reminded us repeatedly, and, and Tucker and, and Michelle, I mean, that's up to us to decide. And that's up to us to decide when to compromise. Um, but when it comes to a legal issue like this, especially one that involves um, the power of the legislature, I, I would be, have a, I could not compromise. Jim? If I would just counter to that, I respect what Representative Gannon is saying. However, the bill last year, we did compromise on that in the end by passing a new bill that satisfied the governor's concerns on the appointment process to get a bill done. So if the choice is between getting a bill done or not getting a bill done, that's a choice we make. Uh, on every part of it. I don't know what I'm doing yet. Other thoughts, committee? Bob and then Warren. To follow up on John's point, I think it's a fine line between compromise and road. Compromise often enough to erode. That's something I think for future legislative bodies we need to be careful. Warren? I'm delighted to have such wonderful colleagues on this committee, and that includes everybody. In this particular case, I'm with John, and I appreciated Bob's ad on compromise versus erosion. I think the power of precedent is very strong, and um, I can't see why we wouldn't follow through with what we think is the best structure um, for standing up this um, commission. So uh, that's where I live. I personally prefer a five-member board. Uh, I think there's plenty, plenty for the board to do. I personally like the idea of having five. There's that much more expertise and representation on the board. And I'm hoping and thinking that if that does occur, that, that might have an easier, easier chance of uh, 
passing, okay, without major, major related issues. But I am for a five person. So, Michelle, do you have the ability to pull up the um, language that the committee kind of decided upon with respect to the five person board and who appoints the, the five members as as the committee looked at on Friday afternoon? Um, or I, I think you extracted that from. Right, uh, I started on your committee amendment. So yeah. I could go down to my office and send it up. To no, that's Kelly. that's quite Sorry, all right. I didn't, um, but it was essentially, I think, as, as you already discussed. So it would be what what you agreed to to see in your next draft for uh, is that it would be a five person board. You would have the governor still appointing the chair. You would have uh, one appointed by the speaker, one by the committee on committees, one by the treasurer, and one by the attorney general. We decided not to require specific backgrounds for those particular appointments, but that you did want to require the board to uh, to establish an advisory committee that would encompass some of the expertise that was listed in the way that the S54 came over from the Senate, so that you would you would have representatives there uh, on such social equity issues, some you know on finance and management and regulatory compliance. Um, Things like that. So, Jim has made an informal proposal that uh, that we change the appointing authority for two of those members. Is that what the I heard you say? Mm -hmm. So that um, so that the governor would have a total of three appointees. Um, so I think. We need to have uh, a committee vote on that. We can just do a show of hands. I don't think we need a roll call. Um, so would all those in favor of changing the, uh, the appointing authority for the two additional board members um, will be able to vote yes on that. If, is there any other committee discussion on this question? The governor still appoints the chair. It's the governor a, appoints the chair in the construct that we conceived of on Friday afternoon. <clears throat> in expanding it to a five-person board, the governor would still appoint the chair, and the other four members would be appointed by four different entities. Personally, would be maybe more comfortable with that if the board itself elected the chair. But that's no, just a comment. And you know, and and. and if the governor had three appointees, I probably could be convinced that that would be okay as a way to offer some balance. I'm just, listen folks, I'm just looking for some middle ground. Yeah. I, I, we're spending a lot of time on this issue, a lot of time, and we want to get it right. But we can be high on principle and not get a bill done. So I just put it out there. Um, I'm trying to help you get to a finish line. Sorry. <laughs> I, I appreciate I'm glad I didn't set that aside. <laughs> um, I appreciate that, but I, I keep coming back to the point that John made, which is that um, because this is not a first, the first time we've heard this issue, uh, it is really important for us to take the time to consider a number of legal opinions. We've now heard from the Attorney General's office, uh, from the Governor's Council, and from our own Legislative Council. Um, and I think it's important that we make careful consideration about how we uh, respond if there isn't a, uh, somebody asserting that there is a separation of powers issue. So I'm just looking for a little clarification on, is there a semi-motion on the table as far as, uh, sorry, the, the two additional, could you repeat that? <laughs> so Jim had proposed that we give the governor a total of three appointments to the board mm -hmm. as a compromise. And I would be also open to 
the board selecting the chair. <laughs> Which could, you know, could be chosen by three people. Right. Um, I'd rather just give the governor the, personally, I'd rather just give the governor the uh, ability to appoint the chair and the chair set the direction of the board. So are, are, are we at the point where we have some agreement that it's going to be a five-member board, or are we still... Um, I thought we had reached agreement. I thought on we that. had. Okay. I thought okay. we had yeah. that I mean, agreement on Friday afternoon. Yeah. yeah, I'm not necessarily denying we did. I just. I mean, we haven't we seen it page. in the bill language because we really haven't gotten through the yep. our okay. first walkthrough of the bill. So I had asked Michelle to hold off on presenting us the revised language until after we've actually given her the whole yep. bill no, to fair. revise. That's okay. Now I get it. Yeah. I get it. No, because especially when you get your weight, you're not getting it. <laughs> so, Jim, to your point though about getting the bill across the finish line, I mean, I, you know, it is more important that we hold true to what our legislative powers are than that we compromise in order to perhaps head off some sort of conflict um, down the road. I mean, we have to. I believe we have to do what we we believe is right, and um, and our legislative council you know, gave what I thought was a pretty thorough uh, opinion on this. Rob, I, I, I agree with most of your statement, Madam Chair, but I think that, that part of what we do here is compromise in this building, and as much as I understand from a principal perspective, there's a different human opinion here um, the third branch is fairly important in this process and if we really do want to get across the finish line um, this legislation is going to look differently getting there than it started anyway and the intent is to get it there you know, there's one thing about compromising on a policy position. I, I mean, you know, especially if the administration is opposed to something in the bill and they've identified policy issues such such as, you know, whether it's opt-in or opt-out, you know, highway safety, roadside testing, um, you know, prevention. I mean, those are all policy issues. I mean, those are things that, you know, I hope we can work with the administration on. Um, but this is a different question. and. In some ways, it is really a bipartisan or tripartisan question. Uh, I mean, it comes down to the legislature's legal authority under the Vermont Constitution. And by compromising here, as Bob said, you know, we're starting to erode our authority under the Vermont Constitution. And that concerns me, especially because this is not the first attempt to do this. There are repeated efforts by the administration to usurp our power. And that concerns me. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and I hear you, my friend, but I seem to recall that just this morning there was several boards where the examples were five, if it's a 13-member board, you know, I think seven were from the legislative side and six were from the, the executive side. I mean, there was a much more balance in that regard, I believe, on most, if not all, the boards. But what we're talking about here isn't totally unique no. either way. Hmm. But, but you know, we have no promise from the administration that they won't veto this bill based on um, a separation of powers argument. That's fair. Yeah, I would argue that it is unique in that regard. Past performance is never does seem to be an argument that's coming on 20 more and more, and as we defer and defer and defer, I think Betsy Ann said that the court takes into consideration past mm -hmm. history, we might very well be building a history for future legislatures of our willingness to say, no boss. Well, um, I forget who said, but the, the two bills that we're sort of talking about, the one last year and then this one, um, 
my recollection is is that they were quite different and the roles of the executive directors and things like that were very, very different than what we're talking about even today. Are we ready to decide, committee? Any further discussion? So if you are in favor of Jim's proposal to to give the governor three appointments to a five-member board. Please raise your hand. And if you are opposed. Marsha. I'll just point out, too, that in, the, in recent history, the governor has um, been allowed to choose two positions that previously he or she had not, and that would be the commissioner of liquor control and also the commissioner or secretary of education. And that those two positions previously were um, appointed by their boards, and now the go governor ultimately has the decision to to appoint the, the final. I think liquor has to bring three candidates to the governor, but the governor get, gets to decide which person actually will become the commissioner. Mike? I hear, I hear what's been said, said here. I appreciate your Concerns about eroding, and I also appreciate there's been an offer of compromise. I wonder if there's another way we could compromise um, by suggesting two appointments for the governor. We can certainly discuss that. Does that sound like a, another compromise to your compromise? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I would be very open to that. I, I, believe me when I say it. I don't have any ownership on any of this. I'm trying to get to a place where we can make it. Otherwise, we're just spinning our wheels. So, and, and I appreciate uh, Representative Merwicki's um, thought, and I would support that. Uh, I would suggest, if you were looking at appointing that we talked about, that maybe it's not the treasurer, um, but we keep the attorney general from the law enforcement and as an appointing and leave the others in place. I can appreciate that. Bob, did you have something like that? That was my question. Who gets cut from the puzzle? That's just my opinion. I'm not, I, I don't have any ownership on that. I just and think that would make the most sense. In response to that, I've worked by committee now. Yeah. 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 <laughs> <laughs> in response so, to that, in terms of comment, No doubt, um, but law enforcement to me is perhaps a little bit more important. And I think the uh, the adv advisory commission board could be a good role for the financial end of things. Just Warren. How I wanted to agree with Jim about having the attorney general be that fifth appointment. One, one from the House, one from the Senate, one from the Attorney General's office. Uh, I'm not certain what I want to do about who appoints the chair. My preference would be to have this group of five decide amongst themselves who would be the chair. Marcia? Originally, when the Liquor Control Board was set up, um, and they decided that they would um, choose the commissioner, uh, it was to keep the governor away from the dirty business of selling liquor. Mm -hmm. So I guess I'd, I'd have to ask, how does the governor's office view being involved in, in the 
in the cannabis business with the, the governor being directly involved? That sounds like a great question. A good public question. I mean, I don't think that we have prepared the governor's no. office to come in and uh, and answer that specific question. Um, although, uh, certainly, if they would like to answer that on the record, I would welcome them to do that. Um, but just being mindful of the fact that I promised you an hour lunch break, and we need to be back here at 11.30. Um, 12.30, 12.30, sorry. <laughs> yeah, to be back here four minutes ago. Um, this time that we spent this morning was, was really intended to be focused on whether we, as the House Government Operations Committee, have concerns about the separation of powers issues that have been brought to our attention. The policy questions of how many board members and who appoints them um, are, are separate from that. Um, and so I am happy to continue to have those policy conversations. Um, but over lunch, reflect on the fact that what we were, what we spent the last hour and a half looking at was um, separation of powers and whether we have the authority to appoint members to an independent cannabis control board. So I'll see you all at 12.30. Have a happy lunch. Get some fresh air. Is this time with you? Uh, no, in all reality, the reason why we're meeting at 12.30 is because Michael O'Grady has a fairly tight schedule and uh, so we are actually infringing on his lunch time <laughs> to, uh, to have a conversation. Now, I understand that you would like to walk through with us so that we understand a little better about the rulemaking process and, and in the context of the timeline of the um, cannabis board um, promulgating rules and, uh, and pushing the go button. Uh, you would like to share with us your thoughts on that. Uh, do you have supporting documents that you would like I, to pull up, or I is this a, but more I, of an open conversation? I think it's, uh, I'll, I'll walk you through it, and I think it's kind of self-explanatory as, as I walk through it. Okay. Um, and I'm a visual learner, so I just, didn't know if you, sorry, if sorry you wanted us that. to look at the timeline and contemplate the well, timeline as laid out in S54. Well, why don't you educate me first about the timeline for what's under S54? Because it's my understanding that most of the operative provisions go into effect in July of 2019. If there is a requirement that the board be appointed by September of 2019, and that the board initiate rulemaking by October of 2019, and that by September of 2020, that the board start accepting applications. Is that correct? That sounds right. Here we go. And in that time frame, the board needs to hire an executive director, and a consultant, and an administrative assistant, correct? Right. Yes. So, so you're basically, the board won't be in existence until September. You probably won't have staff until late October, which is beyond the time frame for when they are supposed to initiate rulemaking. And then rulemaking, unless you specify that it's going to be through some expedited process, Rulemaking has specific timelines for when things must be done. And um, so. The timeline that I'm looking at shows 11 months. Right. So the, the fastest that you can make it through rulemaking by doing everything exactly in the, the minimum time frame and going from the subsequent step to the next step on the exact day that the subsequent step ended mm -hmm. takes four and a half months. Mm -hmm. And that's only if you have one public hearing and you don't have to respond to public comment. 
if you have more than one public hearing and you have to respond to public comment and the public comment is substantial, you're talking about 10 months. And that's how long it would take to do rulemaking. And you won't have a board in place to do rulemaking. And, and I should step back. That's 10 months once you file a reasonably complete version of the rules with ICAR. So you file a reasonably complete version of the rules with ICAR, and 10 months later, it will be effective. But you have this board going into place in September. They won't have staff. They won't have their consultant. They won't have a reasonably complete draft rule. Go ahead, Jim. What? How, if we did an expedited rule process, how much would that shorten that? And are there related to that? What's the precedent on when we do expedited? So there's a, a default expedited rulemaking in statute called emergency rule. An emergency rule for specified public health, um, significant emergency, uh, there's one other criteria I'm forgetting off the top of my head. You can go to rulemaking immediately. You that, go, that would be something without the legislature saying that the Department of Health had an issue yes. that came up. They could do it if it was a public health mm -hmm. concern. Right, immediately okay. you go to rule, you give it to Alcar. Alcar's got 15 days to approve an emergency rule, yep. and then it's in effect for 180 days. In the past, when you've wanted a rule to go into effect quickly, <clears throat> you have told an agency to use that rulemaking process and then determined or specified how long that, uh, that rule would be in effect for. Because you could not withstand the fact that it, was a, that it has a default of 180 days yeah. and it would remain in effect for however long you specify. They, there have been other instances where you have set up a separate expedited rulemaking se section specific to the rule that you are that you are addressing. You did it with the PUC rules on, on, on um, wind, and you could do something similar for that. What you would do really depends on what you wanted to do. How much involvement, how much public hearing, how much time between filings, that, that would all be something that you, you have in the past specified in an expedited rulemaking, and you could specify um, with this. So my, my, my point is being that you probably won't have staff to draft a rule until October. That time to draft the rule to a point where you could even go to an expedited rulemaking is probably going to take a couple of months. Then you have to enter whatever rulemaking process you want to enter. If it's the regular one, it's going to take you five to ten months, most likely ten, because you're probably going to have want to have more than one public hearing, and then you're beyond the September 2020 date. If you go to an expedited rulemaking, you're still going to be coming up against that September 2020 date, and it's important because the rulemaking includes things like eligibility, the application form. Um, requirements for the applicant to information to provide so that the rule is going to drive what that application looks like in September 2020 and, and I, I just think you're putting the board in a very difficult position with existing rulemaking time any other questions for So we talked about this last week, and we said, what's the, it kind of came out, I don't want to speak for everybody, but what's the harm in giving them a really tight, I mean, make them earn their keep, and then they can come back in January and say, uncle, we need a little bit more time. I'm just, I'm being the devil's advocate here, but what, what's the, 
stop us from doing that. When are they going to request time? Because you won't be in session. Right? They, they determine that they need more time in May or June of next year. You won't be able to give them more time. They're going to have to ask for time only a couple of months after they've been appointed and their staff has been hired. See what I'm saying? Wasn't my idea. <laughs> <laughs> uh, was, it, was it your idea? <laughs> These are all policy considerations that we uh, can take action on if we need to. So if we look at the timeline that is up on the screen right now, um, the application, this is specifying that the application period for cultivators is to begin September 15th of 2020. And as you can see from the fourth line down, the rulemaking process, best case scenario beginning in November of 2019, um, would have to go almost flawlessly in order for the board to be ready to accept applications on September 15th. Right, and so what you don't have in it here is they actually draft a draft rule and how long is that going to take because most rules before they go to, to the rulemaking process they go through an informal process of you draft it up you have some of the interested parties review it provide input and correct me if I'm wrong but I think there's going to be a lot of interested parties here Thank you. Um, and so Will the board in that time frame, will they engage those interested parties? Will there be some iterations that, that before they even get to the pre-filing with ICAR? Jim? But isn't that the point? I mean, there's a lot of work already done out there in different states. And, you know, there may be something that, say, in Massachusetts or Washington State that's, you know, this looks like it fits and we can start from there in our preliminaries, rather than starting from ground zero. And if it doesn't, and I agree with you, it's probably going to take longer than a couple months to even get to that point. But what's to stop them in January of coming to us and saying, you know, could you push this out uh, a couple more months? I, I mean, there's nothing to stop them from coming to you in January in that time frame. Um, I, I, I just have. I, I know you don't want to so set it up. I just want to let you know that it. the it's tight. If if you only have one hearing in this time frame and you don't have to respond to comment, because comment is one of the big things that takes a lot of time for the agencies. If they, got, right. they have a mandate that they, they have to respond, respond to mm -hmm. each comment, and, and that can take a lot of time if there's a, lot, a, a significant number of comments. Okay. And so <clears throat> you're, you're kind of, you're, you're putting them in a difficult time situation. Well, but it's part of the executive branch. <laughs> so. um, I'm sorry. Uh, I'm sorry. <laughs> I, I get out of line sometimes. They, I realize. <laughs> Bob's not here to control. I know. I know. I know. I was also help. told that you <laughs> might want to talk to me about how this interrelates with the hemp program and and potentially whether or not people that grow hemp. Um, can grow marijuana as well? Yeah, I mean, the plant being virtually identical, um, it, it does make me wonder if, there, if, if the smallest scale cultivator license might not look very similar. So the, the 2018 federal farm bill delisted hemp as a controlled substance, but defined hemp as um, cannabis, with a dry weight basis of 0.3 THC, 
in order for a state to um, operate a program, they have to get USDA approval, and that state program has to meet some minimum requirements. There are two enforcement provisions that are minimum requirements of the state hemp program. One of which is if you negligently <coughs> produce hemp with higher than a 0.3 THC level, you may be subject to a penalty. And if you do that three times in five years, you are ineligible. You are ineligible to participate in your state's hemp program for five years. In addition, if you grow hemp with more than 0.3 THC with a culpable state greater than negligence, which I don't know what that means, but something more than negligence, if you do that, they refer you to the U.S. Attorney General for prosecution for cultivation and possession of a controlled substance. So, and if you're convicted of that, that's a felony, and you are ineligible to participate in the state hemp program for 10 years if you have been convicted of a felony after the Federal Farm Bill of 2018. So co-growing, co-registration would almost certainly lead to a, 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 the, the hemp participant being excluded from the program at some point. So I can understand that as a risk to somebody who might be currently looking at growing hemp um, and possibly getting into the cannabis industry, but how is this playing out in other states that have legalized recreational use? Well, that's, 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 the, that's the magic question, right? Is, is, that those growers are cultivating, there are growers cultivating both in those states because it's allowed in those states, right? And, and they, they're either processing the hemp for CBD or, the, or they're, they're taking the THC that they can get out of the hemp and using it in, in other marijuana products. It, it very likely is a, a, a violation of, of the controlled, the Federal Controlled Substances Act where the, the Attorney General are, is, is not exercising enforcement discretion, or is exercising enforcement discretion. So in those states, there is a state level hemp program right. and cultivators? There's a state hemp program, but it has not yet been approved by USDA under the 2018 Federal Farm Bill because that has, those rules have not gone into effect and won't go into effect until at the very earliest um, November of this year. And it's probably going to be later than that. Okay. So there's going to end. This, this might be of interest to those people in those states that are growing both. You have to identify where your fields are when you apply for the state hemp program. And you have to let the regulatory agency come to your fields and inspect them. Mm -hmm. um, so th there may be a disincentive for people who are co-growing in other states to co-grow once the state hemp program, the rules for state hemp programs go into effect. I can see why. With all that said, there's a lot of this still up in the air because USDA has not issued its rules. The rules purportedly allow for the cultivation of hemp products, but they don't define what a hemp product is. So people are naturally saying, well, anything produced from hemp is, is a hemp product. And that's, that's a rational argument conclusion, but it is not certain because USDA has not yet defined that. Um, and we, we are progressing with a, a, a bill in S58, but to kind of short circuit some of these questions, we're defining hemp as something that has the 
federally allowable THC level because part of the discussion is that they may allow a different testing method that will result in a higher THC for hemp as an equivalent to the 0.3 dry weight basis. Mm -hmm. And we don't want to have to amend our statute or rule again um, to conform. Because we conformed the state hemp program three times in the last five years. Can I go back to the timeline for a minute? Absolutely. Would it make sense? I mean, they, Michael does bring up a good point about um, the uh, rulemaking process. And I'm wondering if we should, um, on some of that, back it up either three months or two months. Uh, and they still have the ability next spring to come to us and say it's still too tight, but not. Not delaying it unduly, but yet mm -hmm. set it up so that there's a fair chance that it can be met. Does that make sense? It seems reasonable. We can have a committee discussion on that. Yeah. So, Michael, what would be your recommendation for having a reasonable timeline? What? You know, in, in a normal situation, I would ask the agency that was directed, How long do you think it's going to take you? But that <laughs> agency hasn't been established. Um, <laughs> Um, so uh, I think with something of this nature and the multiple interested parties, it's going to take at least three months to come up with a draft rule that could be submitted to ICAR. So January 15th? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Three months from the date of hire yeah. of the executive director and hope we're bringing up to the, the new year and you, you at least give an opportunity to draft, draft that rule and then enter into a process where you could have the 10 full months of rulemaking. It's still going to be tight, but you it's viable. Michelle, thoughts on that? Um, I just wanted to remind y'all about what else they're doing in, in those first few months, which is uh, developing the tiers for all five different types of licenses and figuring out um, the market, um, what those tiers should be, how much should be grown, what the fees should be for each street, for the application for the annual fee, for the renewal fee, um, anything if you do, if you go with the idea of the prior approval for the advertising, you know, fees, like separate fees like that. They've got to come into the General Assembly in, in January with the recommendation for those fees. They also have to come in in January to you with the year two fiscal year, the second and third fiscal year build out for positions and for appropriations. So just, just to <laughs> things that aren't really, I mean, I mentioned it there on January 15th, but just so you can keep track of that, because I think there's a few other things that in the Senate proposal, um, there's three other things they're still supposed to come back to in January, and I think you guys are looking at kind of maybe pumping those out a little bit already, um, but um, just so you, it's not just rulemaking in those, in those first few months. So we can have a discussion about this um, in committee, but are there any other questions that you would like to ask Michael Grady while we have him? All right. And I'll bring visual material the next time. Okay. <laughs> All right. We'll be counting on it. Okay. Thank, have you. A day. Thank you. So, committee, the floor bells will start ringing soon. Um, we have a bill on the floor. Um, John has a bill on the floor, and we will. We Sounds will like there will be some with him in spirit as he as he uh, presents that bill. So um, we don't want to be late for the floor, but if there are thoughts on the timeline, let's have five minutes of discussion before we head to the floor. This might be really off the wall sort of question, but in terms of moderating things when we're out of session, is there any other body that we could test that power in if necessary? 
does the board get into that kind of stuff? No, or, uh, not, not in terms of extension of rulemaking timelines, as far as I know. Um, they they uh, have to act on fiscal matters. Michelle, thoughts on that? Um, I don't think so. I would also just generally, as your lawyer, recommend against mm -hmm. you delegating any more things <coughs> away from yourself. <laughs> you need to. Um, oh, really? Yeah, I mean, you know, I feel a little particularly strong on that point after this morning's discussion. So. Yeah. Hi. Well taken. Uh, I thought it was helpful to get a reality check as to what they should be able to expect and we may need to fool, fool with things to be pragmatic about this. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think there's a strong point to be made that we don't want to set this new cannabis control board up for failure on day yeah. one. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and given that the task that they have is not it's not one of the most straightforward rulemaking tasks that we might set an agency out to do, um, giving them ample time to, to, to do it and do it well, I think makes a lot of sense. All right, there's the floor bell. They play our song. They are.